delighted that you've joined us tonight uh, for a feast of fun, forecasts, and food, all focused on the theme of the world ahead in 2022. So welcome also to all our virtual participants. Uh, we're very glad to have you joining us for the evening as well. Now, forecasting can be fun, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later because you're going to do some of that yourself in a little while. Uh, but first up, I want to look at some forecasts and big themes for the coming year, uh, all of which you will find in this year's edition of The World Ahead 2022, and you will find copies in English and in Bulgarian, the Bulgarian local edition as well, uh, on, your, on your tables. So um, let's uh, jump right in. I'm going to go with seven themes or predictions, because that's a lucky number, so my chances of getting some forecasts right will be improved. So first of all, democracy versus autocracy. A big theme of 2022 will be the rivalry between America and China in particular, and democracy and autocracy more generally. Both countries want to demonstrate the political superiority uh, of their systems, their systems of, of govern governance, and its ability to provide stability and growth and innovation. Joe Biden, last year when he was inaugurated at his first press conference, said, we've got to prove that democracy works. Unfortunately, dysfunctional politics make America a poor advert for the merits of democracy right now. Democracy has been in recession for at least 10 years, uh, and that goes for the whole world over, the most developed democracies in North America and in Europe as well. So it's not just uh, the authoritarians over there somewhere else. And this year, um, there's a number of elections, notably in France and Brazil and Hungary, which will be seen as tests of the health of democracy. Now, the contrast between the American and Chinese political systems will be brought into very sharp relief later this year, when we'll have the midterm elections in America and the heavily stage-managed uh, events in uh, the Communist Party Congress in China. Uh, I'm just going to interrupt my remarks to welcome uh, uh, to the event the President of Bulgaria. Very pleased to have you and honoured to have you with us this evening. So we just, I was just talking about one of the big themes uh, for this year, democracy versus autocracy, and about how that contest is going to be seen towards the end of the year when the America has its midterm elections and China is holding its Communist Party Congress. So a little forecast here is that the Democrats will lose control of the House and probably the Senate too, which will mean that President Biden has even less scope to get stuff done than he does now. And by contrast, Xi Jinping will be confirmed in power for at least another five years uh, because he's torn up uh, term limits, much like his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin. Now, the chaos and polarization of American politics and, dare I say it, the prospect of a second Trump presidency plays into the Chinese government's view that democracy is messy and inefficient and unstable, and that can make it harder for supporters of democracy to make their case. But if you read the forthcoming EIU Democracy Index report, which I edit and which is out next week, entitled The China Challenge, uh, you will find it easier to argue the merits of democracy and to make the case for democracy against autocracy. Next up, a second theme and uh, some predictions. Uh, pandemic to endemic, question mark. 
So the second theme is a shift from COVID-19 being uh, a pandemic to becoming an in endemic disease. Now, as you can see from this chart, which shows the impact of vaccination in Britain and Israel, vaccination's done a pretty good job in breaking the link between cases and deaths in highly vaccinated countries. Uh, and since we made this chart, the Omicron variant has emerged and that's led to record numbers of cases, but so far, only a small number of deaths. And if that pattern persists, then Omicron could mark a step on the road towards COVID-19 becoming an endemic disease that is still dangerous to some people, but no longer requires dramatic lockdowns or other disruptive measures. Now, one big exception to that in 2022 is going to be China, because China this year will still be pursuing a zero COVID strategy. Now, this worked in the early days of the pandemic, but it looks increasingly unsustainable in 2022, given the much higher transmissibility of Delta and Omicron variants, uh, and the fact that the Chinese vaccines are not so effective. So China faces a year of much larger outbreaks and more severe lockdowns as it races to develop new vaccines based on the mRNA technology. Now in the developed world where vaccine coverage is good, the virus no longer poses uh, a deadly risk to most people. Uh, and in addition to the vaccines, there are other tools now available to fight infections, in particular new antiviral pills. But in much of the rest of the world, vaccination coverage is still poor, and Omicron is a reminder of the importance of ensuring global vaccine coverage because new variants can emerge at any time and quickly spread around the world. One thing to watch out for, though, this year is new forms of the vaccine that can be delivered via skin patches or inhalation, uh, which are new developments which could make the expansion of vaccine coverage much easier. So the end game is a situation in which the virus is everywhere, but can be managed and poses little danger. I would say we're closer to that world, much closer to that world now than we were a year ago, but we're still not there yet. A third, a third theme is the economy. Supply chain crunches, and a spike in energy prices that we're seeing at the moment, they are a consequence of a very rapid bounce back from the pandemic. Essentially, in 2020, and to some degree in 2021, people were unable to spend as much money on services, such as holidays, going out to restaurants, and so on, because of lockdowns, and they spent money instead on goods, and that overloaded supply chains and pushed up prices. Now, this chart shows the shift from services to goods in the US, but the same thing essentially happened in every single major developed economy. In fact, the shift in the UK was the biggest of all, uh, and the US shift was, was second to that, but every OECD economy basically followed the same pattern. Now, the result is that inflation is the highest that it's been for decades. Uh, and until recently, most economists and central bankers argued that this was temporary, that it would quickly pass with the help of some small interest rate increases. Now, there's more concern that we may see inflation higher for longer because the virus is continuing to disrupt supply chains, not so much through lockdowns, but through labor shortages caused by the spread of Omicron. So workers are forced to isolate. And that means shortages and delivery problems will persist and price rises are likely, unlikely to, to slow down. So the virus has made inflation harder to fight and central banks are going to face some difficult choices as we're already seeing in 2022. A forecast here, our forecast is that globally inflation is going to remain elevated throughout 2022, surpassing 5%. But in Europe, we expect a slowdown in inflation in the coming months. 
and we're um, below consensus in Europe on our inflation forecast. So we think towards the end of the year, it's going to come down towards the ECB uh, target of around 2%. So inflation is going to be a big risk for the economy, global economy in this year, and that is being exacerbated by the rise in global energy prices, which is also, they are, we expect those to remain high, at least through the northern hemisphere winter before starting to fall later in the year. Uh, central banks are going to start a tightening policy in 2022 to curb inflation, but they will do so, aim to do so fairly slowly for fear of derailing the economy. Now, Omicron has intensified risk about another big threat to the world economy in 2022, which is a slowdown in China, which, of course, China has been the main driver of global growth in recent years. Um, China's zero COVID policy, which I already mentioned, requires big disruptive lockdowns whenever a few cases are found in a particular city. Um, and Omicron may make this much worse, affecting economic activity in China and beyond and further straining supply chains. And of course, the Chinese economy is very dependent on the real estate sector, which is also in trouble, as we've seen with Evergrande. So GDP growth in China could fall to 5%. Uh, in 2022. Next up, I want to talk about a big theme for this evening, which is the environment and climate crunch. What we saw at the end of 2021 was some long-term plans being unveiled to decarbonize the world, colliding with an energy crunch. So in Britain, Britain was hosting the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow. At the same time as it was doing that, that the government was turning back on old coal-fired um, power stations to address this energy crunch. So energy prices have been rebounding along with the economy, boosting demands for fossil fuels. Now, it's not clear how long that will last, but even if it's short-lived, more crunches could happen because investment in cleaner energy infrastructure is about half the five trillion US dollars required to reach net zero by 2050. And maybe this current energy crunch seems at odds with this goal of tackling climate change. But the solution to both problems is to boost investment in cleaner energy infrastructure. Now, controversially, that might mean spending more money on natural gas as a bridge fuel for countries that rely heavily on coal. And it should mean more spending on nuclear power too, though that's become quite controversial in Europe. Many more countries have pledged to get to net zero by the middle of the century, such pledges now cover 90% of the global economy, up from 30% in 2020, but the details are still vague. And obviously it's easy for politicians to promise that something will happen in 30 years time when they're not around uh, anymore. Now the hope is that governments will provide more detail at COP27, which will be held in Egypt in November. And one thing that we can be sure of in 2022 is that we will have more extreme weather as we did in 2021, so perhaps that will focus minds. Wanted to spend a minute to talk about travel because Omicron actually disrupted a return to uh, a reopening of the global uh, travel and tourism industry and uh, places that previously had been pursuing a zero COVID strategy such as Australia and New Zealand and Taiwan, they'd started to unwind uh, that strategy. China, as I mentioned, is the notable exception and is expected, we certainly expect China to keep its borders closed, tightly sealed in 2022 to keep out COVID and maintain stability during the Winter Olympics and also during the Communist Party Congress later this year. The Financial Times recently referred to China as the new hermit kingdom. Xi Jinping hasn't left the country for two years. 
China aside, we'll see how reopening goes elsewhere in 2022 as the Omicron wave recedes. And two things are worth watching. Um, one is this strategy, the sandbox strategy pioneered by Thailand, which will probably be adopted elsewhere. And that's where tourists are allowed to go to certain places, uh, certain parts of the country, such as the resort island of Phuket, where locals have been vaccinated, and then tourists are only allowed to go somewhere else after two weeks and a negative test, or they can just go home. So it's a clever model, and other countries are adopting it. And more generally, it shows that there is scope for innovation um, in travel, in travel rules, uh, that can support tourism and minimize the risk of infection. The second thing to watch is business travel uh, and what happens to that. Some people think that half of that has gone forever. Now, that's maybe good news for the planet, but it's bad news for tourists because tickets and hotels for tourists are subsidized by high-spending business travelers. A quick mention of uh, some big events that are happening in, in, ahead of us in 2022, and that's in the area of sports. So we've got the Winter Olympics in Beijing, the World Cup in Qatar, and they will be reminders of how sports can unite the world, but also how it can become a political football. And we've already had a taste of that at the Australian Open with the controversy over Novak Djokovic and his vaccination status and de deportation and so on. Now, we can expect protests and boycotts directed at these host countries. Uh, in China, the authorities are trying to preempt this by using the pandemic as a pretext for banning foreign spectators. Now, it's hard to boycott something if you're not invited to it, though world leaders who are invited are protesting by not going, and Joe Biden um, is expected to boycott. Uh, but there isn't going to be some kind of 1980s-style boycott by actual teams, despite calls for such a move. So what we're probably going to see is some protests, maybe, by medal winners from the podium, and campaigns outside China against major sponsors, some of which we're starting to see already. Now, that puts sponsors on, in a tricky uh, spot. They don't want to offend China, but they also don't want to offend uh, their customers outside China. As for football, some teams, uh, Netherlands, Germany, Norway, protested against the choice of Qatar as a host country because of its repressive laws, poor treatment of migrant workers who built the stadiums. But again, we're not going to see teams pulling out of the World Cup. Instead, we'll see campaigns targeting sponsors. Finally, I just want to talk about a different sort of travel, space travel. 2022 is going to be the first year when more people will go to space as private citizens than as government employees. I mean, just think about that. That's kind of crazy to, to, to think about it. Um, we'll also see a lot of rivalry between private space firms, and we're already seeing that, and competition, um, and also, as is traditional, between global powers. Uh, China uh, is finishing a space station, which will be permanently manned. Uh, India is having another go at a lunar probe and is gearing up for its first manned flight. Uh, Russia has recently done a provocative anti-satellite test. The other thing that's happening is that filmmakers are getting in on the act and vying to make films in zero gravity. So two Russians, an actress and a cameraman, went to space last October and are making a film. Uh, Tom Cruise was supposed to be doing something similar, but it's not clear what's happening um, about that. But combining the two, in a real mission that sounds like a Hollywood movie, NASA is going to smack a space probe into an asteroid to see how its orbit changes. But all of that could easily be upstaged by SpaceX's new rocket Starship, which is so powerful that it could launch all three pieces of the Chinese space station in one go, and it will probably make its first orbital flight in the spring. So prepare for liftoff. <laughs>
These are some of the themes and predictions for 2022. I hope you found it interesting and thank you for listening.